we're going to have a, a, a large move this year, um, sort of that will that will definitely surpass the sort of 106 peak that we saw um, earlier this uh, earlier in 2024. Uh, Uzbekistan are no longer exporting sulfuric acid to Kazakhstan. They're having their own problems, um, so, so that supply option is gone. You know, I think these could be issues for the next three, four, five, six years. And Niger is not a place that I would be looking to go at the moment if I was Kazakhstan or if I was Kazakhstan for obvious reasons. Um, if Kazakhstan announced that further delays to Balestra, Kazakhstan announced that really next year they're only going to produce the same as 2024, uranium price is going to go pretty bonkers. Kazakhstan is incredibly cheap versus a Cameco, but I think there's probably good reason for that. I think that the uranium market is going to be in a state of sustained deficit for a decade. This is a, the supply deficit for Halo is going to absolutely dwarf um, uh, uh, that in Euro uh, that of uranium. All right, Ben, feels like I should say long time no speak because I've, I've watched all of your interviews and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this one uh, for the first time. Uh, too much to talk about, really, and we'll definitely get to Kazakhstan, the Kazakhstan part of the story and a bunch of other things that you're very well versed in. But let's actually kick it off maybe with China. Um, and it's going to make sense in a second why. But I, I found this through uh, Praise Keg, by the way. So shout out to him. It's a useful green frog on Twitter. But he he shared a, a post that said that the U.S. imported significant quantities of Chinese EUP in 2023, as well as multiple contracts would have allegedly been signed between CNNC and uh, European EUP buyers. Okay. And um, that would... It came as a surprise, both because of the size of it, but then to some people, it would also go against what the likes of Adam Rosentrack have been saying, that the Chinese utility buyers were going to be among the first ones to start panicking because they're not going to have enough EUP and stuff like that. So do you have any insights as to what relates to all that? Like, where is this coming from? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, uh, Antonio. I think that the initial reaction from us was probably the same as, as most people, which was just an element of surprise that not only China was dealing with the US, but also what they were dealing in. Um, again, I think that it's quite a, a well-known thing across the market is obviously the, you know, the scarcity of EUP, um, uh, you know, post Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So mm -hmm. I, I was, I, I was as, as surprised as many other commentators to see that um, as to whether or not the Chinese, you know, utilities are panicking. I don't, think that historically uh you know china have i think historically china have proven they're very very good and very uh, in terms of preparation for for what's coming down the pipeline especially in terms of procurement of metals um we've really seen them be very proactive on, on the front foot in things like lithium rare earths um copper various other energy transition metals and i think that the exact same can really be said for uranium um they are the sort of the big stack bully is maybe harsh but they're but they're definitely the one who they're definitely the sort of sovereign state who have been procuring at, at an outsized rate versus everyone else um and really that is one of these sort of black swan you know very unique outlier events is is chinese procurement of uranium um particularly u308 now whether they are panicking around access to EUP, UF6, I'm not sure. One thing that I'm certain about is that the domestic capacity for, for conversion and enrichment is, you know, really to supply the domestic fleet. So again, you know, my previous understanding was that China's domestic enrichment conversion capacity is going to be used solely for the supply of their own reactors. So when I talk about a surprise around around the EUP deliveries, it's mainly sort of to do with that. And obviously, you know, the other points I mentioned around geopolitics and ge the general scarcity of material. Um, so, you know, I, I would not be surprised if that's sort of the last that we hear of it um, in terms of finding out why they did it. Um, you can have been in this industry for 50, 60 years, and the Chinese government are probably not going to talk to you about why they're exporting uranium to the United States. So we'll sort of leave that to to, to speculation. So uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I can make a, a particularly useful comment on why they did it, um, other than the fact that it, it, was, it was a surprise for us as well as everyone else. But the reason why this even matters is, is just sort of thinking about the... Um you know, supply shortages, if if there's a supply shortage, if they have this aggressive nuclear build-out campaign, 
how can they even afford to export anything? Uh, when I saw it, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, again, element of surprise. I thought they wouldn't wouldn't have exported pretty much anything. Uh, definitely not as much. So how can how how can they even afford, or like, why can they even afford to export it? I mean that 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 really is the question, and I and I don't I don't have a, a better answer than anyone else, other than the fact that you know. Uh, what, one thing I can commentate on is that, you know, we wrote a report around China's incentive to allow uranium to be exported via Shanghai. Um, so, uh, again, I know that we're going to get into this, but we've written a lot on the transport sort of issues out of Central Asia, out of Kazakhstan. And one of the main things that Kazatom from used as a rebuttal against, you know, the issues going by the Transcaspian was that they were looking at a nascent export route via Shanghai. And we did a lot of work on Chinese incentives to allow uranium to not only go via Shanghai, but then also to go to the US. And, you know, our conclusions were China has never exported a pound of uranium um, uh, uh, or allowed uranium to pass um, via its borders and, and into the US. So, you know, again, this is sort of, I, I guess, lending credibility to, to what we're talking about, which is I had not, it's not something that we expected to see. It's not something that I expect to see again. In terms of if I if you wanted me to throw out a, a more speculative point of view, there's uh, some kind of swap agreement down the line or maybe. And again, this is something that we'll get into. You know, we're we're firm believers that Kazakh material in the US that's going to be that has been historically used for swaps, inventory swaps. Mm. We think that that inventory has been drawn down quite a lot. So again, you know, the way that China and Kazakhstan operate now kind of as strategic partners, maybe the Chinese EUP deal to, to the US was something to do with, you know, you know, Kazakh, uh, more of a Kazakh issue. And it's China and sort of lending a helping hand to to to, to Kazakhstan from um, or, or to one of their sort of end customers. So that, that would be my speculative sort of maybe this is what happened. But again, as I say, sort of the opacity in which the Chinese government operate and also anyone buying and selling uranium, especially at the government level is, is really, really difficult to, to get a proper gauge on. When I first saw it, I thought, I immediately thought of a uh, house of cards like this is, and I thought like, is this more of a geopolitical thing than it is a uranium supply thing? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that's, I mean, that that's where you're also kind of getting to with it, with this whole thing. And why I wanted to start there is because I've also been paying attention to those relations, that relationship that you mentioned, the Kazakh Chinese relationship, Specifically, wondering whether the Chinese could be the solution to Kazakh to 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 Kazakhstan problems, uh, sulfuric acid problems. Mm -hmm. um, do you think Kazakhstan problem will eventually import uh, sulfuric acid from China to to solve their issues? Yeah, m my understanding on the subject is that if it was an option, that would probably be, you know, obviously the, the number one solution that they could use. My understanding is that it's not an option um, for various reasons, but primarily the fact that it's actually just not uh, legally binding for them to be able to import um, uh, Chinese sulfuric acid. Now, the reasons for that uh, sort of remain to be seen, but this is more of a common, uh, more of a commentary from someone that I've spoken to in the industry. I think that again, you know, if the solution was there, why would they not take it? We can talk in detail about the about the sulfuric acid problem, um, but. You know, historically, Kazatomprom have relied on Russia and Uzbekistan to meet that, to sort of supplement that that, that sort of natural deficit that they're going to have every year. So we'll put some numbers around that. At about, you know, at current production levels, they require about one and a half million tons of sulfuric acid per annum. They have two current um, sulfuric acid plants that operate um, under the Kazatomprom banner. That produces about 680,000 tons. So you know, you have a sort of 800,000 ton a year deficit. Now, they sort of, as I said, they've had three options. Sorry, th I, I mentioned two, but the third is also, you know, buying from the Republic of Kazakhstan. In their 2022 annual report, Kazatom from mentioned that at a sovereign level, Kaza uh, Kazakhstan would be short one and a half million pounds, one and a half million tons of sulfuric acid per annum from 2025. So, you know, we're sort of get, getting there now. Um, and from based on the recent conference call, my understanding is that uh, Uzbekistan are no longer exporting sulfuric acid to Kazakhstan. They're having their own problems. Um, so, so that supply option is gone. From Russia, 
one of the component parts in producing sulfuric acid. Now, again, this is probably a good time to say, that, you know, sulfuric acid is not a very complicated thing to produce. Um, one of the main components in producing sulfuric acid is currently not coming into Russia due to sanctions. Um, so that's, you know, this is a this is a, a component that they normally get from, from Europe or the US. So Russia is, is obviously struggling to meet that meet those obligations for, for sending sulfuric acid to Kazakhstan as well. So, you know, th this is not a, um, this is not a short term sort of, you know, knee jerk issue. This is kind of systemic, I would say, mm -hmm. in that, you know, I think these could be issues for the next three, four, five, six years. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, that they're going to have no acid coming in and obviously that they're trying to address these issues by building out their third plant um which i i know you know we'll talk about um so it's sort of you know i think that the sulfuric acid problem is a combination of various events that are sort of you know have, have come together all at once and and ultimately is going to result we think in a, a complete inability for kazatom from to be able to ramp up production much past where they are uh, um, this year where they plan to be this year, what they've come because that's a, a big thing too, what they tell yeah. us that they're going to do and what they actually do, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the numbers for this year are, you know, about, I think it's two or 3% increase on last year, about mm -hmm. 22, 21,500, 22,500 uh, tons per annum. The, the sort of laughable number is the, 2025 number which they've already said is not going to happen you know over 30 million sorry over 30,000 tons uh, uh production mm -hmm. per annum uh next year we'll find out in august the sort of the, the the quantum of that um production miss our best guess is that you know we think that as i said it's going to be about in line with, with with this year's production next year um maybe a, a slight increase but again, this really goes back to the the, the Budanovskoy mine, and you know it's very carbonate rich, very deep um, new assets. And when you're acidifying these these new assets for the first time, it requires a lot more acid. So the numbers around that are they need a they need one point five million tons of sulfuric acid per year for the current supply. In order for them to get up to the numbers they spoke about last year, it's about three million tons. Um, again, they domestically you know in-house they have 680,000 tons this is a huge amount of asset that they're going to require that they need to find from elsewhere so I guess back to your original point around China they might be a part of the solution uh down the line but I would be surprised if they're able to to do it all themselves um and maybe this is you know the time to commentate on on Balestra and and you know what um the likelihood of them ramping up, you know, in time is we were quite early. So we, I would say we caught on quite early to the fact that this wouldn't be produced, that this wouldn't be up and running by 2026. They've now pushed it to 2027. I wouldn't be surprised to see if they pushed it further down the line. Um, this is purely based on the construction of the previous two acid plants. Balestra won the contracts for both of those. And the time from... The, the the license or, or the the contract being signed to full ramp up of production was about six years on average across those two projects. So, you know, this initial Balestra, sorry, the, the, the third Balestra contract was signed in January this year. Um, if you put plus six onto that, it's definitely not 2027. Um, however, let's apply a discount. There's a huge, uh, you know, sort of sense of urgency that they need to get this going now. So let's say that it takes them four years from from now. Twenty twenty eight is about you know where, where I would say that these guys could start to ramp up. What does that mean in terms of production? It means the Budanovskoy mine, which requires which requires a, a massive amount of acid, and generally you know the production ramp up at other assets in, in Kazakhstan that's going to require a massive amount of acid. These production ramp ups can't happen without. The, without these without these necessary volumes of, of, of sulfuric acid so that's you know part of our thesis uh, quite a large part of our thesis for why because that's and prom are going to struggle to ramp up production and again this goes back to that incredibly uh you know simplistic point which is 
This is 43% of global supply. This is four times the Saudis dominance in oil. Um, if, you know, anything happens in Kazakhstan, we, you know, we really saw it for the first time in a long time when they announced the initial production miss earlier this year and the spot price moved up $5 overnight before they'd even announced the size of the miss. Um, you start to see just how sensitive uranium prices are to what happens in Kazakhstan. So this is something that we think that the markets may be underestimating um, it, it, the fact that this is not knee jerk. This is a systemic issue that we think could, could go on for a long time. That actually happened on um, one day before my birthday, I believe. So it was a very nice present to see. Nice happening birthday there. present. <laughs> but it seems well. It seems you you'd almost think that the government getting too involved or geopolitics getting too involved in natural processes is not a good idea. Who'd have thunk? But um, at the same time, I'm thinking the what would it take? Like, what does Balestra need to over deliver on your expectations? Like, what could happen that they're in production quicker than you think? Yeah. I, I definitely can't sit here and say that I am an expert in the construction of sulfuric acid plants, but I can only go back and look at previous uh, timelines. I guess, you know, I, I know that, you know, we can sort of speculate on, you know, what's happened as a result of the recent floods in Kazakhstan, but it's stuff like this that can only delay, you know, you know, road infrastructure, getting access to certain materials, component parts, just, just generally being able to get around uh, during these projects. This, these are things that are not going to help uh, in terms of what they can do to speed it up. I guess throw more money at it, get more people there on the ground. Um, now, again, I'm no expert in how to build a sulfuric acid plant. I can only look back at previous projects. So, you know, I guess more people, um, uh, and just making sure that, you know, every component that they need is in place. But again, it's another thing that is definitely worth us looking into is what are the component parts they need? Are they going to be reliant on Russia? Are they going to be reliant on China to build out these plants? Balestra is obviously is an Italian company, so probably not. Um, but in terms of transporting all of this, uh, you know, over to Kazakhstan, again, the transport issue is something that, that we should definitely talk about. But I couldn't sit here with uh, much credibility and say that, you know, this is what they need to do to, to increase the, the, the speed of building the plant. So I'll, I'll leave that. To, okay. uh, I'll have to save that for another for another call. Then this is the Internet. You When you don't know something, you just make it up. That's kind of how it works. But uh, <laughs> what is the um, well, it, Italy transporting stuff to Kazanoprom? That's just the Trans-Caspian route that, that Kazanoprom came up with or more or less. I mean, it's among the same lines, I assume, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I guess it's just the Trans-Caspian in reverse, stepping off yeah. going via St. Petersburg. Um, so I would assume that, that that's the way this all gets done. Is it easier? Like, does it uh, well, probably matter in terms of geopolitics who's transporting who? Like, Italy might have an easier time transporting stuff through what would be the you know Bulgaria and the Black Sea and then Turkey. Then Kazakhstan would have doing it in reverse. I, I assume, mm -hmm. like, one one way of the route is easier to do than the other. Is that the case? Honestly, I haven't looked at it in reverse because we're uranium guys, and Kazakhstan right. definitely don't it definitely don't import uranium. Mm. Yeah, they import um, pasta though, so that's important too. Yeah, that's true. Very. Important. But um, so so the thing with to, to go back to China and the sulfuric acid, where I'm coming from with this is also because I found something that I can um pull up here to look at, and it 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 says it's on the OEC website, and it says that in 2022 China was the, the number one largest exporter of sulfuric acid in the world. Um, not that much. It was it was only $638 million in the grand scheme of things of what they export, but other stuff seems like a relatively low number. Um, but in terms of uh, who's importing from them, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, it's not Kazakhstan. It's Chile, Morocco, India, Brazil, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So the first thing pops to mind, like what, why why not unless some geopolitical issues happening? Why Why is this even a problem, this sulfuric acid? That was the first thing that popped into my mind is like, okay, sure, they cannot import it from Russia, but they can import it from China. Sulfuric acid, not the toughest thing to produce. Like uranium is way harder to mine than sulfuric acid is to produce as far as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, you know. I, I, and, it, and I think to be clear, it's not the first time this has happened. I think this is the third time where they've had a sort of sulfuric acid crunch. Um, you know, in, in I think the last one was two thousand one and two thousand and nine as well. 
Um, why is it a problem? Um, well, I mean, it's it's a problem because of how much sulfuric acid is obviously required for, for, for ISR, but also I think that, you know, domestically, they just don't have the, the, the necessary you know, amount of production that they need. And I think what's interesting is that at a sort of sovereign government level, Kazasimprom is mainly competing with a company called Kaz Phosphate. Um, they're one of the world's largest um, fertilizer producers, and they're, they're the largest uh, fertilizer producer for the CIS and for Europe, but one of the largest for Europe as well. Um, at, at a sort of government level, now obviously fertilizers for food, uh, at a government level, this is it sort of takes priority, takes precedent over, um, over the uranium industry. So, you know, it's kind of been allowed to happen, I guess, you know, as I mentioned, is, is a convergence of various events, sanctions in Russia, uh, an inability to import from China. Again, need to do some more digging on that. But also Uzbekistan going through the same problems. Uzbekistan are trying to ramp up their own domestic production of uranium. They use ISR um, in, in situ recovery mining techniques as well, which requires a lot of acid, uh, same as Kazakhstan. So. I think that again, it's like you know, just a, a bunch of things that have that have all happened at once. So that that that's, uh, you know, this is going to be in this in the context of the previous squeezes for sulfuric acid. This is going to 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 be significantly uh, significantly larger and significantly longer. Mm. There's um, I'm I'm glad you're bringing up Uzbekistan because there was uh, an article also shared by that helpful green frog on Twitter that was talking about the industry becoming more global. Well, we're talking about a, a bunch of things, not only that, but it mentioned that because Adam Prom is considering the, the possibility of of going abroad and looking for uranium, basically. And in particular, obviously, they're going to go to Uzbekistan. It's one of their neighboring countries. But also they were talking about Mongolia. They were talking about going into Africa to um, mm -hmm. mine uranium. And I, I don't necessarily have a, a specific question around it, but it seems like something important that you would have insights on. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I we, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll definitely address that. I think that what's interesting is you know because that's probably back buying in the market, um, in the spot market. So you know you start to see this sort of sense of right, you know, we're not able to pull it out of the ground in the same way that we said whether we would or we thought we would. So we need to go and find uh, secondary sources of supply, whether that's in the market or or in terms of foreign assets. Um, you know, my understanding is that. Obviously, if we start with Africa, um, Niger is not a place that I would be looking to go at the moment if I was Kazakhstan or if I was Kazakhstan for obvious reasons. Um, Namibia is incredibly well aligned to sort of, you know, the West and uh, not just the West, but it's it's a great jurisdiction in which to do in which to do business, especially mining. Um, and obviously, you know, that, that there's some uranium assets there as well. So maybe Namibia is a potential option for them. But, you know, what signal does this send to the market that Kazatomprom are leaving Kazakhstan to go and, and or potentially, you know, looking at uh, trying to find foreign assets in order to supplement, you know, whatever, for whatever reason they want to do it. It's a very, very strong signal to the market that Kazatomprom are short or, or, or at least short. You know, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but they, they see a, a real squeeze coming down the pipeline. So I think in terms of the market signal, it's about as strong a, a signal as you can get. Um, in terms of sort of Uzbekistan, you know, my understanding from from our sort of guy on the ground there is that the Uzbek, the Uzbek ramp up in terms of production is not, you know, globally going to be that significant. I think they're looking at sort of, you know, uh, maybe a, 40 50 percent increase in terms in, in their production so um and again why are they why are they um excluded from the same issues that kazakhstan have in terms of sulfuric acid supply again they, they use the same um uh, production uh, recovery technique as as they do in kazakhstan so you know i, I don't think that um this is something that is anything but good for the uranium price if they if kazakhstan are looking elsewhere then it's a strong market signal that the world's largest uranium producer 43 percent of global supplies is, is not um not able to meet or, or not happy with the, the the domestic production numbers so yeah yeah well and, and then there's the argument as to they don't have to do that that's all 
that's all OBS basically they can ramp up anytime they want and and I think you as the one of the few people who's really specialized on this are basically disagreeing with all that they cannot there's many there's many reasons why they cannot ramp up what do you think you could be missing though like what's something sort of within the lines of the more I know the more I realize how much I don't know and that's mm -hmm. probably the case for you and, and, and Kazakhstan, given how obscure of a, of a country that is, specifically within the uranium space. What do you, what's something you don't know about Kazakhstan? What do, what do you think is sort of the extent of your knowledge or something that could be sort of a wild card that you or, or I mean, anybody in the West cannot really know? Interestingly, it would it would have been the, the quantum of the domestic assets, i.e. like, you know, it's such a massive country and they've got all of these exploration sort of projects and development projects and obviously the large produce the largest producing mines in the world um so if you'd asked me that question before you know what we just spoke about it would have been you know i don't have a good grasp on the exploration potential of kazakhstan i would assume that it's it's quite vast but again to your point if they're looking elsewhere if they're looking at foreign assets then they clearly don't have that level of confidence that you know in those domestic assets so maybe you know the one thing that i think is is pretty difficult to understand is um is inventories uh foreign inventories um you know i think we've got a pretty good grasp on total inventories because obviously they're a public company they have to report that um top line uranium inventories were down 18 over 20 percent actually year on year mm. um to, to one you know one of their lowest levels in, in the past decade um i think that okay i i guess i do i do my answer to this question is going to be you know around authority where you know who, who is making the decisions at because from you know they're 75 80 percent owned by the kazakh sovereign wealth fund uh samra kazina and um I think that there is inevitably a sort of sphere of influence. Um, I, I don't think that, and I think that Kazakhstan have done, have made great steps in sort of detaching themselves from that Russian sphere of influence, but I think inevitably that still remains. So I guess one thing that it's just impossible for us to get a gauge on is, you know, we can sit here as analysts, whether you're a financial analyst or whether you're sort of thematic analyst looking at the, the nuclear sector more broadly and say, this is what I think is going to happen. But you know, if there is th this sort of more authoritarian figure over you, which is actually, you know, really making the decisions. And we've seen the sort of repercussions of that with the Budanovskoy mine, you know, 50% of it being sold to, to two Russian oligarchs via a sort of, you know, a, a, a deal that was definitely not well received by the Kazatom Prom management team. So where was that decision, you know, how was that decision made? Trying to, trying to gauge, trying to get real clarity on, you know, um decision makers especially if you're if you're an analyst in this industry it kind of throws everything that you think you know out the window because ultimately you can sit on every management call every conference call you can speak to the management team and they can say this but if they're not the ones actually making the decisions then um then then you know it becomes an issue now i'm not for one second saying that the because atom prom don't have you know their own autonomy to make decisions i'm saying that historically we have seen examples of uh you know examples where there is sort of they've maybe answered to a higher power where they you know they sort of lost control a little bit of, of their decision making so i think that's something that <laughs> ultimately what this means for the uranium price i think probably is only positive to be honest because it just means that if someone came in and said actually we need this or if russia came in and said actually we need this much uranium and you know, you have no choice but to give it to us, then obviously that's that's great for the uranium price. But, you know, Budanovskoy, the first, I think the first three years of production are going to Russia. So if you apply this sort of sulfuric acid crunch um, plus the, you know, the T plus three years, you know, all going to Russia, 2028, the third Balestra plant is, up, you know, up and producing, let's say then Budanovskoy gets acidified, really start to ramp up production in 2029. The first three years go to Russia. It means that the West don't benefit from this world's largest uranium mine until 2033, so nine years from now. Um, mm -hmm. Really gives you a sense of, if you have a supply-demand model in front of you, um, 
you know, and you have these bottom line figures for what collateral farms are going to be able to ramp up to, let's say that they can ramp up to that by 2030. It's kind of irrelevant for the West anyways, um, until, as I say, 2032 or three now, I could be completely wrong. And they bring online the third plant in 2027, like they say they will. Um, but again, it's not the 2025 production numbers that they said they were going to have. That's for sure. And I think the the risk here is always sort of to the downside. Um, rarely do you hear about a building project, even if it's just a residential building or or whatever, getting built way earlier. Like, oh, hey, we built this, you know, way under time and way under budget. That rarely happens. Why would it happen with something as sensitive as as uranium or this or anything around it? Do you? I know you you speak to someone within the ANU, the ANU. Um, physical fund. What are they telling you about the revolving door that we saw last year? Is that something set to continue? Do is is the the, the Kazana Prom team set with any insights there? Um, not uh, not really for me to comment on. I, I don't think that you know, as far as Arnu is concerned, um, you know, it's obviously been delayed. Um, and as far as we're aware, um, it's remains in a sort of delayed status. So it, whether this is I don't think it's really anything to do with the, the revolving door management wise. I think, again, that that really started as a result of um, of the Budenovskoy deal. And I think that was kind of fairly well covered. Um, Arnu is, look, I mean, the website's down. Um, it, it doesn't look like it's sort of moving anywhere anytime soon. And I think that's sort of, you know, testament to, you know, just how tight the supply side is for Kazatomprom. And, you know, this is, you know, half a million, sorry, half a billion dollars worth of uranium. Like, in, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a, a huge amount of uranium. It's not insignificant, but it's not a huge amount of uranium um, at, at today's prices, especially. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But as for now, the status remains sort of, you know, coming down the pipeline, but it has been for a while. Hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's always coming. It's always soon. It's kind of like junior mining, something we can also yeah. talk about. But it's, uh, what do you, what do you, why I'm asking this is because I'm thinking about, so the revolving door would definitely seems like there, it, it's a political thing as well. But at the same time, the jobs market in Kazakhstan overall is not, has not been ideal with the protests and everything going around in the economy. Do you follow the macro situation on on in, in Kazakhstan specifically to then related to what's happening with Kazakhstan Prom? Uh, yeah, and not not in not in a huge amount of detail, but we keep you know we're always trying to make sure that we're sort of ear to the ground on the political situation, the economic situation, but we're not looking at it in nearly as much detail as obviously as obviously the uranium sort of side, but you know. I know John uh, Champaglia spoke about this the other day, you know, the sort of visits between um, Tokayev and, and, you know, the French government and Tokayev and the Azerbaijanis, um, you know, President um, Xi's first visit from China post-COVID was to Kazakhstan. So, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to see how strategically imperative Kazakhstan is to many countries around the world, um, whether it's oil, gas, uranium. Um, so, so the political situation is sort of something that we really, you can get some really good indicators, I think, for, for what's happening in terms of uranium from from these various visits. Um, to kind of going to see Putin, obviously, um, over a year ago, but you know when he did, um, mm. uranium obviously being a, a, a massive. Uh, sort of talking point within, within that conversation. So politically, yes, um, we have an amazing uh, uh, team that we've outsourced uh, that, that help us with that. Who who you know produce the commentary that we need to to make sure that we're sort of really uh, up to date. Mm. Well, I'm also coming at this from the angle of the currency because uh, well, obviously we all know that the dollar is going to zero and gold is going to fifty thousand dollars per gram or something like that but at the same time i'm looking at the uh kazaki kazakistani tenge to uh in relation to to the dollar and you look at it last time in in 2011 sort of right before um fukushima happened and you had to 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 buy one dollar or one united states dollar you had to pay like 140 150 tenge uh right now you have to pay 450 so their yeah. currency is just weakening massively over time. How does mm -hmm. that play into into the whole thing? 
Um, if I was a if I was a a broker setting a price target for Kazakhstan problem, it's obviously a problem. We don't really do uh, broker research as such, but ultimately it's gonna it's gonna have an, an imp a negative impact on on the company's bottom line. However, you know they're selling in dollars, they're selling uranium in dollars. Um, so um, you know I know all of the sort of companies' financials are done in Tenge, but. Um, Ultimately, it's just it's 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 a it's a currency risk that, that if you're an investor in Kazakhstan Prom, you have to take now. Maybe that's a sort of you know lead on to you know what how we view Kazakhstan Prom in terms of as an investment. Yeah. Um, the world's largest uranium producer is going to do well over the next few years because uranium is going to do well. Um, the best sort of case in point is Cameco announcing a 9% production cut and shares being up 5% the next day. It's like the only industry in the world, uranium, where you can announce a production miss and shares rally. Yeah. Um, so I think that Kazakhstan, regardless of, of you know, as I said, the the gearing that uranium prices have to everything that happens in Kazakhstan is, is incredibly strong. Um, so, you know, if Kazakhstan announced that Further delays to Balestra, Kazakhstan announced that really next year they're only going to produce the same as 2024. Uranium price is going to go pretty bonkers. So, you know, it's not like they're not selling any uranium still. They're still going to reap the benefits of the 22,000 tons that they produce this year at a much higher price. And also, what is interesting about Kazakhstan from versus Akamako is that their price sensitivity is, is, that they're going to reap a lot more of the upside in uranium prices than a Cameco will for sure, because you know the, the contracts that they're signing are, are, are a lot more um, a lot more geared to, to that to, to rising prices. So, from an investment point of view, look, I see we 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 see value uh, much more value elsewhere, but will Kazatom from be a good investment over the next three five years? Yes, I would say so. Hmm. Well, I, I spoke to a fewer buyer maybe last year, somewhere in the summer, and he told me about the sort of his strategy was to to hedge with Kazatom Prom because if they're doing well, then sure, the stock price is going to do well. But if they're not doing well, then the uranium price is going up and therefore benefiting the Cameco and then the other, you know, smaller producers. That was sort of his, uh, you know, hedging approach, if you will. Is that something you, you employ as well? Um. We don't manage any assets as a firm, so not really. Um, it's I, I don't know if I see Kazatom Prom as a as, as a hedge versus anything else in the uranium sector. You know, to to the to sort of reiterate, Kazatom Prom do bad do well. It means that um, it's probably not good for uranium prices. You know, if Kazatom Prom are coming out and saying we're going to ramp up production twenty five percent next year. Um, that's not great for uranium prices. You know, I, I think that we sort of saw that. Um, we saw that with Cameco, with, with the Cameco um, uh, Q4, where they didn't, didn't miss production. I think people were expecting them to miss production. Um, and also they didn't announce any downgrade from the 18 million pounds, um, uh, respectively, between the two mines this year. And we saw prices come off a fair bit after that. So, um no, I don't. I, I I don't view it as a particularly interesting interesting hedge. Um, you know what what was interesting over the past few months was maybe like the short oil play long long uranium. Um, now that's obviously not so interesting anymore with, with oil prices doing what they've done. But mm. uh, I, I I I don't think that we we think about. Um, I don't think we think about it like that. It's why I bring this up is because I'm looking at the. Um just at the market caps of, of both companies, so Kazatom Prom and Cameco. Uh, Cameco is about twice the price of Kazatom Prom, um, if I'm seeing this correctly. So their market cap in US dollars, 21, 22 billion, Kazatom Prom 11, so 11 billion yeah. dollars. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So so that, that's primarily to do with the free float. Um, it's, you know, only about 20% of the company is actually listed uh, Kazatom Prom. Um, the rest, as I said, you know, is, is owned by Samrat Casino. Right, but if they're not okay, so, but if the stock is not performing, 
better than Cameco right now, what would it mm -hmm. take for it to start performing better than Cameco? I, I don't I don't think that it will. I think that it, it's going to trade it inherently trade at a, a discount, just given the geopolitical um, sort of discount that, that you should probably apply. I mean, I saw it. I went out when I flew out to Kazakhstan in November 22 for their investor day for their analyst day they presented a really interesting slide um which i'll send to you so you can maybe pop up on the video uh now but it shows that you know the the kazatom prom discount versus what's happening in the spot price versus the peers um and it was kind of them trying to show look we're cheap but actually for me it was showing that this is the way that you're going to trade forever pretty much is not, well, not forever, but th this is the way that I see you definitely trading over the next decade um, is, you know, that again, back to this point around a sort of, you know, whether it's a Russian sphere of influence or whether it's ju just the, you know, the sort of political risk that you take in somewhere like Kazakhstan, um, it's not going to trade like a, like a, a sort of AAA rated Cameco. Um, I don't think ever. Hmm. That's exactly the point that I was that I was bringing up, and this is because because cheap or undervalued doesn't mean overperformance. Um, not always, and and in, in this case, you just have proof. No, I, I, I mean, if you you know put put a blindfold on and you say, what is the cheapest uranium stock in the world? It's because prom by an absolute mile. Um, um, and you know you could probably put a couple of maybe developers in that ring uh, as well, but because prom is incredibly cheap versus a Cameco, but I think there's probably a good reason for that. Hmm. The, I, I do want to talk about um, the how you approach it maybe personally or, or, or sort of from the perspective of developers versus explorers, so on and so forth. Um, sure. But it's oftentimes said, what, you, what, what you're reminding me of by bringing this up is that it's oftentimes said that one company basically solves this bull market, therefore you don't get bullish uranium. Funny that's been said since 2019 and, and Uranium's yeah. outperformed pretty much everything, but that's next gen's arrow coming online, right? Mm -hmm. uh, allegedly thought um, to come online by, it is increasingly hard to believe, but they, they, it's it's thought to come online by the end of this decade and doing somewhat 28 million pounds in its first year. What uh, What's your take there? I don't I don't assume you expect it to come online, but what's your, what's your overall approach to looking at next gen? I heard, you know, I, maybe it was John saying that you know the Canadian sort of you know pro provincial licenses have given one uranium license for production right. in the last decade or something. Um, next gen, you know, Arrow will come online. Whether it's twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, not too sure. One thing that you know we said to our clients at the beginning of this year is. Let's assume that everything goes to plan this year. Because that's from ramp up, but an off score. Because that's from start to produce it, but an off score. Cameco meet their numbers. The uranium price was one hundred and six, and the idea is that if any of these go wrong, then you know, sorry, this is when the uranium price was at ninety or whatever, whatever you know, ninety five at the turn of uh, the turn of this year. And if anything goes wrong in any of those, we start to see an increase. And it's not like if these things come online, when you know, in the in the way that they say that they will that uranium prices come off um so i think you know with arrow it's like i think it's baked into people's supply demand models uh most of them and arrow not coming online just adds to the squeeze um it sort of adds to the deficit or it ex exacerbates the deficit um not sort of the way that i wouldn't look at it is arrow comes online and you know the supply deficit is solved to put sort of this into context, and I know this is a much smaller producer, UVC, let's say UVC produced a million pounds this year, solves about 1.8% of just the deficit. Um, you know, it's, it's the, these projects need to come online to give even a fighting chance of, of nuclear power plants globally staying online. Mm -hmm. Um, regardless, we're going to start to see, you know, what we're going to see a, a squeeze at some point. And I saw a really interesting chart earlier, which is the sort of relationship between uh, SWU and SPOT. Now, the disparity between those two is really starting to close. And for me, this goes back to the point that, you know, we we made, and I, I think various commentators made post Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is 
what what was happening in conversion and 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 in enrichment was sort of your crystal ball for what is going to happen in in U three hundred eight. So, you know, previously utilities would procure U three hundred eight yellow cake, then U F six, then E U P. That obviously sort of flipped on its head post Russia's invasion of Ukraine because there was that obvious sort of panic around you know future supplies of, of E U P and U F six. So, we're now starting to see. I think we're going to start to see again, um, you know, this all filter down to um, to U three hundred eight, and that's where you know. And again, when I mean, we talk about the spot mark and sort of the, the the issues with it, but also you know how, how it, obviously it is a leading indicator of of what's happening around U three hundred eight prices. But I definitely think that you know we're going to have a, a, a large move this year um sort of that will that will definitely surpass the sort of 106 peak that we saw um earlier this uh, earlier in 2024 oh that's an uh this is good this is going in 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 the recap sort of in the beginning of the video to hook people for watching but it i'm thinking about what's going to hold back um next gen and, and and just the other guys who are trying to get into production as well like fission for example different ore bodies uh, fission is actually putting some interesting videos on that Mm -hmm. online that I that I just looked at that it seems like they might have an easier time but these are not easy stuff to bring into production right and so that's technical difficulties the one thing that pops to mind but also the technical team behind it so it's skilled labor um where do you find it in an industry that's been depressed for a while so the and and then you have the permitting and all that what what do you think are sort of the do you, do you also think that those are the main challenges that are going to maybe push back their timeline or what else are you seeing? I think that there was a 10 year market where uranium wasn't produced um, really. And, you know, I always say the same thing. What do people think that personnel, that labor in this industry did for 10 years? They didn't stand outside in the Athabasca Basin in minus 20, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for someone to say, let's go mm. restart production. There's been an exodus of talent from this industry um, that has been sort of, you know, taken up by the likes of cobalt, nickel, lithium, all of these super attractive sort of energy transition metals, you know, projects. Um, so, so this is something that I speak to our clients about a, a lot. Um, and it is, you know, the average time that it takes from, exploration to production for a Western uranium mine is about 12 to 15 years. You mentioned fission. They discovered um, uh, their asset in 2012 um, and won't produce until 2029. You know, it's a 17-year lead time mm -hmm. um, but between exploration and sort of finding the deposit and, and then producing the deposit. Um, one thing is for sure is that, you know, with higher prices, the incentive to move fast and um, well, the incentive to move quickly is obviously high, you know heightened massively because you know you really want to capture as much of that upside as possible. I just don't see a situation in which you know U.S. the U.S. that hasn't really produced uranium for thirty years, you're going to bring online all of these mines, um, you know, on time and on budget. Um, I, I just don't see that happening. And I think that Canada is is not, not insulated from that at all. I mean, Cameco have sort of been um fairly open about personnel issues as sort of one of you know one of the contributing factors into why they had to why they announced a production downgrade last year. <laughs> I think that these are all things that are going to add fuel to the fire. Um now, if you were to tell me that. Arrow doesn't come online um, until 2030s. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, I think that these miners are going to have a tough time bringing these product, bringing these assets into production. Um, but this is what goes back to the point around, you know, a part of our selection process is looking at, at management teams, high quality management teams that have done this previously. It's a reason that we absolutely love fission. Um, it's just one of the most, if not the most experienced, um, you know, teams in the Athabasca Basin that have actually produced before. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, that gives us a level of confidence that other management teams just can't really. Mm. It's also about retaining 
uh, that talent because maybe if you push them too hard to keep your timelines, they might want to go somewhere else and then somewhere else they start pushing them again. And mm -hmm. do they unionize? Do we see strikes? I mean, those are things that are typically normal in other industries. So why not see them here? I think that's there's a lot of things that not everybody's thinking about. Although, I mean, if I'm if I'm thinking about Aero, I'm pretty sure that fuel buyers are also thinking about it and including it in their models and maybe thinking, oh, mm -hmm. do we buy now? Do we wait for this to come online? Do you think they rely on it coming online? And then from talking to fuel buyers uh, within utilities yourself, what's their level of, of understanding of the technical aspect of bringing a mine online or do they just take the company's word for it? Um. I think that they obviously have a, a, a base understanding of, of the technical sort of process around bringing these assets into production. But again, they don't have a real comparison to use over the last sort of mm. 15, especially in the US, they don't really have any any comparison to use over the past 30 years. So I think that, yeah, you can look back and say they did it then, did it in the 80s and the 70s and the 80s, US produced a load of uranium. Why can't they do it again? It's been 40 years um you know it's like it's not you know there's no uranium tap like there is oil um it's it's a really long process i was in zurich at the end of last year and I was, it was at a, a sort of gold silver precious metals more fo more precious metals focus summit um and i was asking the gold miners and the silver miners you know what how long does it take you to go from from point a to point b in terms of you know actually starting to produce and then I would ask the same question to the uranium miners. And it's like three or four times the amount of time for a uranium mine versus a precious metals, gold or silver mine. Um, the inherent regulation that comes with producing uranium, um, the licenses that you require versus a gold or a silver mine, um, just because it's a class seven, you know, cl classified as a class seven radioactive material. Um inherently there's going to be much longer uh processes around this. So you know, you take that, you add it to potential personnel issues down the line. Um, I think that utilities understand, they must understand that, this, that these are risks, potential risks to the assets that they need coming online, coming online. Um, uh, so, so I think that, I think that people probably aren't as well prepared for, for, for what's to come as, as, they make themselves out to be fuel buyers utilities are paid well fuel buyers are paid for one thing one thing only to make sure that these reactors have the fuel that they need they're not paid to time the market they're not paid to to, to make a, a few million dollars on a sort of carry trade they're paid to make sure that these reactors don't shut down hmm. and this is maybe one of the most uh compelling uh all points for the uranium thesis is this price elasticity of demand you know fuel buyers need their uranium they'll pay 500 dollars a pound they'll pay 50 dollars a pound um the 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 issues that come as a result of not having these mines operating is hundreds of millions of dollars passed down to your to, to your everyday consumers so it's just not something that's that, that can happen it's true um that, that that's actually one of the things that attracted me to it as well and and reading up on it moving on sort of like what else we don't have right now relative to what was happening in the 50s 60s and the 70s and in ramping up uranium production is uh, a cold war right i mean that, that was a, a big part behind that it was a big driver behind the staking rush around Elliot lake in um in the athabasca basin but we also don't have the murray pazims and the stephen romans the mm -hmm. father of the current stephen roman who are just incredibly aggressive not afraid to break you know move quick and break things and regulation was just different it's a completely different world actually uh there's no mm -hmm. bomb to be made there's there's not enough people so i i agree with yeah I, I agree with that do you what are your internal models telling you regarding when we're actually going to get out of this uh supply deficit on a on a realistic base i think that the uranium market is going to be in a state of sustained deficit for a decade um i think i think maybe through 2040 um now it's very difficult to to have a sort of 15 year foresight from here but mm. 
again, I, I think that people often forget when they talk about this, they forget what's happening on the demand side. Um, you can bring on Arrow, you can bring on uh, PLS, um, you can bring online a new Kazakh asset. You know, uranium demand is growing significantly, um, you know, to the tune of maybe 250 million pounds um, by 2030. Um, this, again, COP28, 28 countries pledged to triple nuclear capacity from, from current levels by 2050. We're going to need a lot more uranium. And this is back to the point around if these projects don't come online, what happens to prices? It's like the demand side is not standing still at all. Um, the demand side is growing year on year. Nuclear capacity is growing. Compound growth rate of three and a bit percent year on year. I think it could be a, a lot more than that now with that recent pledge from a, a, a COP. So, yeah, I think that I think that it, looking at a supply demand model, looking at our internal supply demand model, we have three models. I have a, a bear, a base, and a bull model. And the, the the bull model removes a lot of Niger. It doesn't factor in really any production ramp up at Kazakhstan through 2030. It pushes our to 2031, 32. Um, it pushes a lot of the US sort of uh, a lot of the US projects down the line, or at least applies a discount to those. They're gonna they say they're gonna produce five. We put it in as three. So depending on which project. So you know, the the, the 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 bull case within our internal models is multi hundred million pounds def of cumulative deficit by by through through 2040. Um so again, you know, I really think that you know the, the, the baseline thesis for uranium when we started to look at it in 2017, 18 was we are nuclear bulls and the supply side looks pretty fragile and a decade of underinvestment in all of these assets means that it's going to be very, very, it's going to be a slow, a slow supply side response. And for me, that is bull point number two, maybe after the sort of fundamentals of, of fuel buyers paying 500 or 50 hmm. bull point number two is versus pretty much any other commodity story that we have seen. We see a supply side response that is incredibly slow vis-a-vis uh, -vis your typical oil price goes up and south you pump an extra couple of million barrels a day or Venezuela or wherever. Um, there's just very, it, it's not an agile industry at all. It's mm. it, everything, everything happens in nuclear at a glacial speed and the same applies to uranium. It, that actually reminds me of a counterpoint that I've also heard is that if you think that uranium mines are going to be difficult to build, what makes you think that all the goals that countries are setting for building nuclear power plants are going to be met? And so the 3% growth that you mentioned of Kager, that's already, it's it's not fast growth, right? It's not 20% or anything like that. But if you apply sort of a slowdown to it where it's harder to get regulations or whatever, um, you get into an even slower growth. And the way I sort of solve that for myself is just thinking about, yes, but the, we don't necessarily need any growth in nuclear for there to be a bull case for uranium because it is much more a supply thesis. And that's sort of what you're getting to here, I believe. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's a great segue into SMRs and and sort of next gen uh ne next gen reactors. Um the again the pledge to triple nuclear capacity by 2050 is not going to be achieved by building traditional nuclear power plants. We have to apply production line economics to nuclear power plant construction the same way that Ford did with the Model T. Um, we need to be able to roll these things out quickly and at scale. And the UK, uh, where I'm based, is a case in point of this. We're terrible at building nuclear power plants. Um, you know, I mean, we can maybe blame EDF a little bit, but really it's... Um, it's it's going to be so difficult to roll these things out at scale. So I completely agree with your point. Why does the same not apply? And I think that SMRs still remain the most compelling uh, sort of rebuttal to that. Um, the number one bottleneck that these um, that these SMRs, the, the, the production of these SMRs face is a lack of access to fuel. Bill Gates is terror power delaying, you know, the, the nature and reactor, uh, their nature and reactor by two years because of a lack of access to fuel. Mm -hmm. All of these projects were financed, um, were 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 financed under the assumption that Halu 
would cost seven thousand dollars a kilogram we think that it's that price is closer to sort of thirty to forty thousand dollars a kilogram today so wow. i think at seven i think it's seven thousand dollars a kilogram Oclo had an IRR. Sam Alton's uh, SMR company had a had an IRR um, of seventeen percent. That goes to zero uh, with, with with Halo prices where they are today. So, you know, I think we're quite well documented on our views on ASPI um, and sort of their ability or QLE, the the, the uranium sort of nuclear fuel subsidiary. Um, we believe that you know this is a place that we think investors have to have an allocation. Um, um if they want proper exposure to not just you know nuclear but also the sort of next 25 30 40 years of, of the uranium of the uranium story hmm. it, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up new tech i don't know enough to ask anything or push back on any of the smr assumptions but it's, I, i'm sort of trying to apply the same thinking to both sides so applying you know technical revolutions to the demand side let's apply technical revolutions to the supply side as well. And I know you've talked mm -hmm. about ASAP isotopes before and, and stuff like that, but could technology be the thing that solves the price spike or the supply shortages here? Mm, yeah, maybe. I mean, the most interesting companies that I've seen in response to that is these sort of AI startups that are looking at, you know, that, that, that think that they can, the, the percentage chance of finding assets using their using their models is is much much higher. I forget the name of the company, uh, but it but it's, it's private companies that are looking at um, applying artificial intelligence, machine learning to be able to go out and find and find these assets in much mm -hmm. much faster, much greater accuracy. So. Yeah, maybe. But then again, I think that to that point, there's no scarcity of uranium in the world. The the, the issue is the actual sort of extraction of uranium. Um, so forget technology for a second. We need a regulatory framework that's going to support this, or that a regulatory framework that can be just replicated and replicated. The same applies for SMRs. But in terms of production, I don't see a DLE comparison for uranium that it is for lithium. I don't see that sort of coming down the pipeline. Um, it's just an incredibly bureaucratic process that requires an, an incredibly, it, it, it requires a highly technical team. Um, and I think these are the bottlenecks, not particularly sort of, you know, um, I don't think that it's particularly relevant um, or, or particularly reliant on technology. Um, the, the the supply the, the 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 speed of the supply side response I don't think is reliant on technology at all. I think that it's these points around bureaucracy and regulation that that are really the main barriers. So could be completely wrong. Um, I've seen let's get uranium out of seawater out, out of the you know yeah. and deep deep sea mining. So maybe someone comes in tomorrow and finds a hundred five hundred million pound deposit um in the Atlantic, and I'm completely wrong. Well, it's going to take um, a higher uranium price. I mean, the price times time solves everything, I suppose. Uh, and you mm -hmm. can come up with it, with it all. But the, the, the times time is, is important here because it, it just takes time as well to develop mm -hmm. that at scale and make it commercial. Um, what, well, yeah, what about the, the, the other technologies in, in the space in, in terms of investing exposure, like laser enrichment, again, the isotopes thing? Is that something you guys are looking into? Yeah, so I mean, I, I give a, a our experience on this was post twenty twenty two, post Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had a lot of demand from clients. How can I get exposure to enrichment? You know, Russia's fifty percent of global enrichment, uh, thirty forty percent of conversion. How do I get exposure to these? So, conversion, the only way you can get exposure in public markets is Cameco, but it's not a huge part of their bottom line. I mean, it's not insignificant at all, but it's not, uh, it's, you're not getting pure play conversion exposure. So really for conversion, there's not much you can own. Um, for enrichment, we went down a path of, right, you've got Centrus, let's do a load of work on Centrus and see what's interesting there. What was interesting there was it took me about a week to figure out that they don't actually enrich any uranium themselves. Um, um, and that's testament to to i mean i think that for us that was a massive surprise to see that there was this company that was making a couple of hundred million dollars a year just selling russian eup at a markup to us utilities so 
the Russia risk there meant centrist was not interesting for us. I mean, we're also not particularly sold on the fact that they can produce halo using the centrifuges. These are 40 foot cylinders that spin really fast. They pass down higher rich product down each process, down each stage of the centrifuge to, to the next one. Um, you know, our, our view on that is that for them to produce about six metric tons of halo, um, which is sort of going to, you know, that will be global annual demand. We think in the next five years, uh, it's going to cost them three billion dollars. It will take them about five years. So, you know, we think that there's much more scalable options. So, Silex was the next one that we looked at. Silex have sort of been promising the world for forty years. They said, you know, the triple opportunity for them. It was we can take uh, depleted tails. We can make natural uranium. Uh, we can be a top ten global producer of natural uranium. We can apply it and do it the same for US six, uh, for EUP, and then also for for Halu, for higher say low enriched uranium for next generation reactors. Uh, they've just pulled out of the sort of Halu RFP, uh, uh, the DOE RFP, and you know that's, I think you know again don't want to speculate too much, but maybe they don't think that they ha that the technology is ready yet. Um, they've kind of been saying that for quite a while now, and then that led us down again, and then we found ASP isotopes um sort of halfway through um more towards the beginning of 2023 um when i first read the asp isotopes deck it was i remember sort of sitting in my office and thinking you know before i take this to my boss um you know can this actually be real um like everything they say that they can do can this actually be real because this is a company that is now producing real revenues from the medical isotopes business um and you know has spun off the, the the uranium business which which they'll list later in the year and that's going to be an opportunity to get real pure play exposure to the next 50 100 years of nuclear power this is a company that we really believe can solve um can solve you know we, we talk about, about the supply deficit for uranium this is a the supply deficit for halo is going to absolutely dwarf um uh, uh, that in Europe, uh, that of uranium so again it's it's using quantum enrichment technology versus laser excitation at silex the selectivity of that i.e selectivity is just a sort of fancy way of saying the ability to be able to actually separate the, the two isotopes um uh u235 and u238 um the selectivity is about you know 50 times that of, of somewhere like centrus um again lab stage uh, proven at lab at lab stage um many years ago but we are sort of optimistic and having spoken to and spent a lot of time with the team i was out in south africa looking at, at their facilities a few weeks ago um we think that you know it's it's an incredibly attractive opportunity i mean aspi as well um is you know it's, it's, a, it's a revenue generating business today um that has an opportunity in not only medical isotopes but also in uh semiconductors they've just signed a, a contract with a large semiconductor um manufacturer so real business making real money today with a sort of uranium kicker that has the option or has the potential to sort of um capitalize on you know they have a 30 billion dollar uh indicative order book from smr companies um um if they if if they can do it, then this is a, probably as exciting an investment opportunity as you can get in commodity technology healthcare markets today. Hmm. That's a big statement. I don't again not not much to push back on because I don't focus too much on tech because I just sort of oh, I just assume BS when it comes down to tech. Why is because I I just assume it's less technological than they claim. Kind of like the thing that's happening with Amazon right now is there was a news piece a couple of days ago saying that uh, those Amazon shops where you can just walk in and then walk out without paying that was all mm -hmm. claimed to be AI and whatever it sort of came to came to the knowledge uh, public knowledge that they actually use thousands of people in India to actually manually put those things into your cart and then bill you and so that's AI why washing. I assume what's that AI washing yeah exactly yeah exactly uh there's been a lot of memes around that when um uh what is it called chat GPT came out but um, it's interesting when we talk about these things. Why? Because it seems like logically you would think, what stocks do I go on, go in from here on? 
and you think, well, there's a supply issue. That's really the conclusion of, of the conversation so far. There's a supply issue. If there's a company solving that issue, I should go into that company, meaning you go into companies that have a realistic chance to getting into production and profiting from the higher price. Mm -hmm. That's the logical explanation as far as I get it. But at the same time, I think it, when we look at this bull market, you know, 10 or 15 years in the future, we're still going to see the same thing that's always been true during commodity cycles. And that's that uh, the, 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 the shit coast, pardon my French, mm -hmm. outperform, you know, the companies who don't do anything and the companies who find the uranium. But at the same time, we don't have a uranium problem. We have a uranium supply, prob supply problem. So why even go into the explorers who are looking for more of the thing that we already have? We don't have the supply. We do have the uranium. How do you, you know, you and I met in Zurich at the SMI. You were talking to some of the juniors. It, it, how do you look at the at the junior space overall? I think that it takes something really special for them to distinguish themselves from one another um, because the pitch is really difficult to differentiate. Um, the uranium story sells itself. Now, if I'm a believer in the uranium story, why would I want to take exploration risk? Um, is kind of how I've we viewed it over the past couple of years you know we want to be geared to rising prices we want to be geared to companies that as you say have a have assets that actually have uranium um if we're such fundamental believers in the uranium story why take exploration risk the answer to the question is because you can generate completely outsized returns versus a developer versus buying a yellow cake or buying a sprot so i think that there is a there is a, a a good argument that you need an allocation to a basket of exploration companies. Um, and that was really my incentive to go out to Zurich and speak to a bunch of them was, you know, uh, I, I spent probably the last 18 months really not taking the call um, on exploration because of the reasons that I've just mentioned. Um, and I think that was a good decision because we've seen what's happened to uranium prices in the last 18 months. And I would rather have been aligned to, 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 to your sort of Delta One plays and, you know, the likes of Cameco was up 100% last year even. So I think that we're now starting to, at a, a sort of corporate level, look again at exploration because a lot of the value, not a lot, some of the value, some of the easy money has been made on the producers. And, you know, Cameco, for example, I, I would maybe sort of stay clear from just for now while, while it cools off again i mean we've just seen the shares rally 20 percent in the last sort of week pretty much um um on a long-term view i think cameco is, is still remains very compelling very interesting because of the sort of downstream nuclear exposure that, that they're starting to create but i don't see I don't, I don't see um any reason why sort of investors shouldn't have call them lottery tickets um they're not lottery tickets, but they are, you know, you can do as much work as you want on the geological side. You can do as much work as you want on the management side. One thing that we look for, we think is is a really strong indicator is inside ownership. Um, you know, these companies, you know, where, where management has got a decent chunk of the company themselves, where they're really geared to, to, to obviously to, to, the, to the success of the company. Um, also, you know, looking at previous discoveries, um, you know, the the experience of previous management is what drew us to fissions, what drew us to sort of, you know, UEC in the beginning. Um, but it's completely down to sort of investor appetite. What is it that you want? Uh, do you want to be completely exposed to the price of uranium? Do you want some um, production? Um, do you want to take production risk? Do you want to take exploration or development risk? Um, Obviously, the higher that sort of the, the, those risk parameters get, the, the more reward there will be down the line. But, you know, I guess if you gave me £100 and I could allocate to um, different sectors of the uranium market, I would remain sort of 30 to 40 percent as a Delta One price play buying your Sprot or your Yellow Cake. I would then have sort of 25, 30 percent in, in development stage companies um you know not not all of them uh by any means um but a sort of select few um you know the likes that i've mentioned and then i think you have to have some some real exposure to these emerging technologies um you know the sort of the picks and shovels plays and you know i'll, I'll go back to maybe ai 
really briefly like you see the way that picks and shovels plays have been treated in a, in the ai sort of in, in the ai boom that we're seeing at the moment which is everyone went for nvidia and now you st and then people realize who makes the chips and you go down to sort of asml and then you go down to who makes the cooling systems in the data centers and you see this i can't remember the name of the company it's like 800 percent, and they, they, they just provide cooling services what are the picks and shovels plays that are going to support this th th this massive sort of renaissance in nuclear? So I think that's why you have to have some exposure to, to the emerging technologies, the likes of sort of ASPI. You know, we've spoken to a company, an interesting company called Lightbridge as well, who are trying to manufacture new casings for, for nuclear power plants that make them more efficient. These kind, these are the kind of companies that we're, we're really interested in. Mm. And Indian VEs too. Of course, of course. <laughs> But it, I think a lot of people approach it from sort of the same perspective, where it's they, they, they come into uranium thematically, like they're not necessarily mining investors or metals investors, they come into it thematically. That's why the juniors aspect is so tough for so many people. I see it in the comments all the time, people asking, uh, you know, this stock, that stock, and I'm thinking, like, this, this is horrible. They've been an explorer for 15 years. You're not supposed mm -hmm. to be an explorer for 15 years. No. Um, and and so not not it, it, it's hard for a lot of people. I approach it differently. So I, I approach it, started approaching it since I lost half my money, started approaching it sort of from a bottom up perspective where I, I started the asset level. And if I don't like the asset, then I move on, not necessarily thematically. But it's interesting to see how how you look at it, given that you approach it more from a top top down perspective, how you just described um, your your portfolio. Um what 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 do you think the role is of the financial players right now, both in in your portfolio, but also in the broad scheme of things in regards to what we've been talking here? Because, um, again, as you mentioned, I just spoke to John Chimpagli last week, and he told me that he he doesn't think there are actually fifty financial players. I think there was an article suggesting that there there might be as many as fifty. He said that by their internal estimates, there's about ten. Do you think there's that many? What do you think their role is? How do you think they develop in this market going forward? I'd be closer to 50 than I would be to 10. Um, again, from people that we've spoken to. Uh, um, um, I think that, you know, he hedge funds are sort of the apex predator in um, in this industry who have sort of maybe sat on the sidelines who have been procuring sort of hundreds of thousands of pounds, um, not tens of millions. Um, I think that the role that finance, you know, again, talking about John is the role that financials or, or speculators have played this market is undeniable. Um, it is, um, you know, these guys are sat on a third of global annual demand sprot now. Um, so I think that that's only going to increase more. I think what kicks us in from, let's say, we're at stage two of five in this bull market, which is about where I think we are, Um to kick us into stages three, four, and five, we need uh, institutional capital to play a lot more prominent a role. And, you know, we've spoken with the, the largest asset managers in the world on this, um, all the way down to your sort of much smaller asset managers, family offices. Um, everyone loves the story, but what currently limits real institutional capital from getting involved is the size of the market i mean you add up the the market cap of every uranium equity it's about 65 billion dollars um then put that into the context of a single oil major it's like a fifth of the size of exxon um this is a, a fuel that powers 10 percent of the world um and it's that dislocation that we absolutely love um and that's you know it's a very very simple reason for why it's less than oil because oil makes a lot of money and your rating companies uh, you know there are going to be opportunities for real, exactly what you talk about, assets and producers to make a lot of money. And I think that's going to start to attract financials that you talk about at both an equity level and in terms of the physical markets as well. Um, I don't think that we, I feel like we're sort of just getting started in terms of uh, the ways in which financial uh, speculators are getting involved in this. And as I say, what kicks us on to that sort of fourth or fifth inning is going to be your really large asset managers taking a stake in this industry. Um, and that can only happen with meaningful cash flows. So this is a sort of, it's trying to find that healthy balance of higher prices, incentivizes new production, but really it's not going to be enough production to, to, you know, the supply deficit will remain, but there's going to be a handful of companies that really, really benefit from this. And those will be the, those will be the ones that, you know, will attract the interest of your of your large sort of institutional capital. Mm. It's funny you should mention Exxon because I was um I was looking at their 
balance sheet recently, and they have something like $32 billion in uh, cash and cash equivalents. They can buy Cameco and Kazatomprom with cash. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very yeah, funny to think about it. No, it's it's yeah, it's I mean, you know, we spoke to one of the largest um, mining companies in the world uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm sort of asking them about, you know, are you guys looking at, you know, looking at uranium? And it was sort of like, yeah, you know, we are, but it just needs to be bigger to have a proper to have a proper impact on our bottom line. Um, it needs to be it needs to be bigger. So it's kind of this snowball effect of, you know, higher prices more cash flows um these companies you know liquidity improves and then you know that starts to attract larger players larger market participants and you know from that point down the hill we start to really pick up some uh pick up some speed and that's where i think that we'll start to see um the sort of maybe the prices that some speculators in this industry talk about and the one thing that people don't appreciate enough is applying that three percent CAGA for for nuclear why can't uranium prices just gradually grow at that same pace it's just not inherent to the uranium sector i mean we've seen look at the uranium price chart any uranium price chart it's just incredibly volatile so you need to be able to stomach the volatility along the way but ultimately we think that on a sort of you know even a two-year view this is going to be uh prices are going to be much much higher do you think it's going to be one of the oil majors or maybe one of the large diversified miners who comes in and, and builds out the, let's call it the Western Athabasca Basin? I know a lot of people think about it. Oh, you know, is Cameco going to buy next gen? But I, the way I look at it, I just look at it as sort of as one thing, fission, next gen, Dennis. And I look at it as the Western Athabasca Basin, which can be sort of one complex, if you will. Uh, that is, yeah. I mean, do, do you think, who do you think builds that? I think the oil majors played a well. I, I say I think oil majors played a massive part in in the uranium industry previously in the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s. I think that that's something that I could see happening again. I mean, um, whether it was Exxon, I think it was Exxon that recently got involved in like the lithium space. So, you know, starting to see these companies, especially fossil fuel related companies, trying to maybe deleverage themselves from from. Or, or sorry leverage themselves more to the energy transition um so i think that that's it, it's definitely possible i i do think that again back to this point is like it's just probably too small at the moment um and i think that's testament to to investors that are currently invested in the space we're still early and that's something that i think that people often forget um i, I think that we still remain in, in as i said sort of the, maybe the second um sort of inning of five in this so um We'll start to see, I think, again, that snowball effect picking up and, and start to see much larger, whether it's institutional capital at a sort of asset management level or whether it's commodity traders, commodity, large commodity houses, mining companies really start to get involved in this. This is the next big commodity story, you know, mm. in, in my view. So, Ben, you're English. See. What are you what are you doing giving me baseball analogies? We should talk about football. <laughs> the... I also know I also know nothing about baseball. <laughs> Actually, that's also cricket cricket good point yeah good point that's something i never th think about it's the thing most people don't ever think about it as they should well actually no is it cricket's big in india right there's a bunch of people in india so probably a lot of people play that i would say there's definitely a bunch of people in india yeah yeah <laughs> yeah what's uh what do you think is something that we don't you don't expect here, uh, but basically the same question that I ask you about Kazakhstan. What do you think is something you might be missing or, or <laughs> so the limit of your knowledge? What do you think in the grand scheme of things is something that you might be missing for the supply side of uranium? Something, you know, Black Swan event or something that, that could test your thesis here? Um, I think my answer for that's quite easy. It's It's government inventory. It's, you know, these inventories that are so, so opaque companies you know not not companies that have to report on a quarterly basis governments that might have you know stock uh, outside stockpiles of uranium um i don't think it's a huge risk but it's one that like you just can't get a gauge on really it's, it's very difficult to get a gauge on um and then the other one is you know i think i think is geopolitics is is how are china going to start to sell off some of their for whatever reason start to sell off some of their uranium stockpiles why they would i don't know but 
these uh this kind of goes back to my point about Kazakhstan and like you know whether there's a sort of not answering to a higher power I think it's it's, it's incredibly harsh but I think that you know where are the decisions being made and how you know for what reason are they being made you know backhanded deals go on in metals and mining industries the whole time um and it might confuse people or it might um it might make no sense but I think that geopolitics is very, very difficult to get a proper grasp on. Uh, and also uh, government inventories, I think, is something that is mm. just incredibly opaque. Every video or every conversation that I do on uranium, there is a common saying, don't worry about it. Sput is eventually going to start selling into the market. And you sort of have two groups of people. So you have one group who believe the um, the prospectus, which says, no, we're not going to sell uranium. We just buy it and send it to uranium heaven. That's not how the, the, the fund operates. And then you have another group of people that says the moment, you know, the brown stuff hits the fan, that's when they're actually going to come in and sell, you know, make a bunch of money, but also kill the thesis. What, what part of those two groups are you in? I am in the camp of this, this all ends with a sort of force majeure government saying, we need to keep the lights on. We've invested hundreds of billions of dollars across the world or across our, uh, China's case, across our country in expanding nuclear capacity. We've got no uranium. Um, give us your uranium. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and then at that point, I don't know what the price is, um, but that's probably a pretty good indicator that it's time to get out. Yeah. Doesn't it all end with government? Yeah. That's how we started this conversation. So maybe a good point to let you go and... Um alleviate you from having to listen to my voice what am i uh what am i forgetting to bring up though what is uh what is something you came here hoping to talk about that i'm failing to bring up oh um maybe sanctions okay Sa maybe the sanctions landscape is getting pretty interesting in the u.s now um i think that that's you know it is an event that has kind of been being spoken about for a couple of years that hasn't really come into full effect yet um transport um i think remains a, a key risk particularly out of central asia um we've got two reports public on our website if anyone's interested in reading those if you're having trouble sleeping at night um might help you um but other than that i think we're well covered yeah it's, it's, sanctions is an interesting thing because it's just it was so overhyped at the beginning that I just stopped taking it seriously after a very brief period. But then I feel like I'm I'm not going to take it serious until it's actually a thing, and then I'm going to sort of miss on it. Do you think it's now actually becoming something that's coming closer to to being serious? Not really. I think it's, tur <laughs> it's tur Turkey's voting for Christmas. Um, I don't... Um, even when you read the fine print of these things, like the Russian suspension agreement, you know, when they talk about sanctions, it's weaning ourselves off Russian EUP over the next six, seven years. And if it means that a nuclear power plant has to stop operating, then we'll give them a special exemption license. It's kind of a bit nonsensey. Um, I think that it's, they're kind of doing what they can to show that they want to address it. Um, and I think that's kind of all that they can do at the moment is show that they want to address it. Um, one thing is for sure is that the US are really going to, you know, are, are making steps into ensuring that they have a domestic supply of uranium, EUP, UF6. Um, and I think that's, you know, a, a really important theme for, for people to look at um, over the next few years is, is your US jurisdiction, high quality assets, um, looking at their ability to ramp up conversion and enrichment um, and, you know, the U.S. becoming self-sustainable again in terms of its domestic fuel cycle uh, capabilities. It just hadn't been for, for, for so long. Um, once they can do that, then the Russian sanctions really, really mean something. Hmm. But until then, but until then, I don't see um, I don't see them being particularly effective. Yeah, sounds like it's way out to. Ben, this has been great. I really appreciate your in-depth, specific knowledge and all these things. It's for people wondering, it's oceanwall.com, just as you hear it. It's probably on your screen right now, too. You go to research, you click on reports. There's a bunch of things in there that we also talked about today. There's ASAP isotopes. There's the risks and potential rewards one. There's the Russia report, Chasing the Dragon. A lot of it is focused around uranium. 
Um, there's one on lithium recently. What did you guys stop doing the uh, some thoughts uh, sort of monthly report, by the way? You stopped doing it in 2022, it seems. Yeah, a, a long time ago. A long yeah. time ago. We, we, uh, we, we had too much to write about on the uranium space, so we couldn't... Um... We, we didn't have the capacity to do it all. We're a small team, but we go into a lot of detail on the things that we care about. Mm. How many people is it? Is it over there? Uh, seven, I think, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Okay. You guys doing anything else than, than uranium anytime soon? Lithium, we're looking at again. Um, we're, we're very big in Venezuelan um, uh, sovereign bonds. Um, we think a recovery in Venezuela is, is sort of uh, becoming quite interesting. However, if you search venezuela in the news you might be led to believe differently but we think the bonds are incredibly cheap um do a lot of work do some work in the music space um just raise some money for a beer company which was incredibly exciting and we did a lot of due diligence you can imagine on that um um primarily at the brewery um but yeah i we, mean we, we're a sort of niche alternatives focused investment advisor anything where we think that the underlying asset classes are fundamentally mispriced we're going to do a lot of work you know that when we take when we bring you an opportunity uh we're completely aligned so you know we like to take fees in in shares we like to really try and remain aligned to the investors so um yeah the weird and the wonderful <laughs> well next time we should do the, we, we should talk about beer maybe do a field day thing that could get fun but, I agree. Uh, no, this has been great. Thank you so much for investing your time. I mean, thank you so much for this conversation. No problem, Antonio. Thanks very much.